Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Steve Marinucci, um, a freelance writer on Access.com, Billboard. Oh, my gosh, Goldmine. It, I'm Variety. I'm everywhere. Anyway, uh, welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, where we talk about what's happening in the world of the Beatles, both past, present, and maybe to come. And in fact, we will be talking about maybe to come today. Um, let me introduce the two people that will be talking about all these fun things with me. First, uh, from the great state of Connecticut, he hosts the weekly Beatles show, Every Little Thing, uh, Mr. Ken Michaels. Ken, hello. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Hi, everybody. And from the great state of Maine, uh, Almost to the uh, to the almost past the border north, um, the author of the Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop got that something how the Beatles I want to hold your hand changed change everything I, I'll get that right who for years was the man at the Beatles desk at the New York Times we we love that because he was also the classical music writer at the same time he now writes for the Wall Street Journal. Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. Was that a long enough introduction? (laughs) (laughs) Today, we're going to talk mainly about the uh, Sgt. Pepper box set, but we got a couple of news items to talk about first. And let's start with the the thing that I apparently has been really getting a lot of buzz on Facebook is the debut of the Beatles channel on Sirius XM. Uh, It debuted... Last week, it started with uh, Ringo and Paul giving and doing audio clips, and they've been playing basically everything associated with the Beatles, and that includes Beatle tracks, Beatle covers, uh, little Beatle audio clips. There's also some special shows. Uh, among them, uh, Peter Asher has a show um, that's going to link Peter and Gordon and the Beatles, and he's also going to talk about his stories about knowing the Beatles for years. It has a a great version of From Me to You, which I heard that on the uh, promo the other day. You guys want to talk about uh, the the channel at all? Well, obviously, uh, I've known for quite a while that Sirius Sirius XM has wanted to get an all-Beatles channel. And um, in order to do that, you need permission from all four parties at Apple. And um, and not only that, I'm sure that it must cost them a pretty penny to do that. Uh, in order to have uh, a channel devoted to one artist being a, a solo artist or a group, you either have to have permission from that artist or if the artist is deceased from, um, from the family, the survivors uh, of the family, or in this case, you got to have permission from Paul, Ringo, Yoko, and Olivia. So it's taken quite a while for this to happen, so I'm very happy that uh, Sirius finally managed to to pull this off. I'm sure it wasn't easy for many years for them to do that. Um, And you've noticed that through the years they've had channels devoted to other artists, and um, whether it's Willie Nelson or Bruce Springsteen, which usually with Bruce I think it's just for a short time when he has a new album out. You know, you need permission from the artist to do that. So I would imagine that it's been a tough hurdle to get there, to have an all-beal channel. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned Peter Asher because, you know, apart from the fact that he has the history with Peter and Gordon, he's had such an incredible career, obviously with his association with the Beatles, working at Apple, and then becoming one of the most successful producers in, in music. He's got so many stories to tell, and if you've ever seen him live... You know, the, the VH1 TV show Storytellers, when you hear the word storytellers, Peter Asher was meant to be in a show like that. And he yeah, has, that's, a, that's a good point. I'm surprised they haven't used him yet. He, he has the gift for gab. He loves telling stories. He's never at a loss for words. And, um, you know, he's got so many stories to tell. And just imagine, just from the Beatle years, the Peter and Gordon stuff, Working at Apple, the relationship that he had, especially with Paul, um, you know, there's there's so many stories that he could tell us. So I'm very happy for him. He, uh, that show in particular, I would look forward to quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't listened to the channel yet, although it is being offered for free for a little while longer until uh, May the 30th on their website. But um, 
you know, good luck with the channel. It is, by the way, I, I should mention to anyone that was wondering, because I had somebody ask me again today, it is permanent. It is not a temp- one of those temporary celebration type channels that they do every so often where they they start a channel, you know, to promote an album or something. This is not one of those. This is permanent. So, Alan, you got some? Uh, you got a comment? Yeah, I've I've uh, spent a few hours listening to it, and um, you know, obviously, I haven't heard any of the uh, you know shows that are being done specifically for it yet, which I, I guess really are going to be the heart of it. Um, certainly, for for people like us who have all the stuff, all the recordings, um, it's it's these shows that are going to be the thing to listen to. Um, what I have heard so far is you know just turning it on in the middle of the day for a couple of hours and they're playing Beatles tracks which is you know what you would expect and solo tracks and covers um and it's all great but you know they they didn't in in the time I listened um they didn't play anything including the covers that I don't have on a playlist on my computer so <laughs> I could easily put it on mine on shuffle and have it do the same thing without the interruptions of people saying, you know, that was things we said today from a hard day's night. Um, mm-hmm. cause I kind of already know that. And, you know, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, listening to the, uh, other than that, listening to the promos, you know, like Peter Asher's promo <laughs> has been the most interesting parts of it, you know, been a lot of solo music. Um, what I've heard, it's really been predominantly Paul solo music. Um, I heard a couple of John Lennon tracks. I heard maybe, one or two George Harrison tracks and a couple of Ringo tracks, but so far it's been predominantly the Beatles as a group and Paul, which I suppose isn't surprising because he has the biggest catalog. So if they're programmed by Shuffle as well, it's going to come up that way. And, uh, you know, other, otherwise, I mean, there was there was a funny note on Facebook when uh, someone someone noted that they introduced uh, the Dirty Mac band from the Rolling Stones right. Rock and Roll Circus mm-hmm. as being, you know, influ- <laughs> influenced by the Beatles. Uh, okay, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, so was Wings, I guess, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and the All-Star yeah. Band. <laughs> but, I, saw that. Uh, I saw that. That was kind of, that was kind of interesting. I mean, that would probably rank as maybe the rarest track that they've played. Yeah. Of the ones I've heard, I, I I didn't hear that. I did see that the note, but I mean, most of the stuff they've played so far that I've seen has not been all that rare. Yeah, and they've uh, um for the early albums, it looked sounded to me like they're using the eighty seven CDs because the early tracks are only the mono mixes. Oh, really? Uh, they yeah. are using the the uh, the new the, pepper. Uh, two, 20, they're, they're using the new pepper mix. Yes, they yeah. are. Mm-hmm. So that, so that, you know, for people who don't have that and want to hear it, it's nice that they, you know, that they are doing that, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think probably to be successful at doing this, you have to try to appeal to both mainstream fans and also hardcore fans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, for someone like myself, whenever I program a Beatles show and I play solo cuts that you will not hear on the radio normally, even on a lot of Beatles shows, I'm thrilled to do that. And there are there are listeners of mine that love to hear that kind of stuff. For those people, that's going deep. Mm-hmm. Maybe not for us, you know, maybe not for fans that want to hear alternate takes and bootlegs and stuff like that. But there's all different levels of Beatles fans out there and there's nothing wrong with playing some of the typical stuff. And mixing that with, you know, deeper tracks and yeah, sides right. and rarities. I mean, and I you should know. say that, that you know, despite, you know, what, what I said about the playlist and everything, I mean, I, I it was enjoyable to listen to for the few hours that I did it over a couple of days, you know. I mean, it, it, what can be bad? You know, you're hearing a lot of Beatles right. stuff. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see, and they haven't said anything about this, whether Paul or Ringo will, or any of the... You know, any of the the Beatles family will be involved as far as appearing on that channel. Live, you know, maybe live doing special special shows. I mean, it'd be interesting to see maybe Sean come on and t- and do an interview. It'd be you know, Julie Julian would be especially interesting, I think, 
you know, and of course Paul and Ringo would would be, and you know Olivia. I mean, it'd be great if if uh, our you know Danny. Uh, be great if they all showed up on the channel once in a while. Maybe they will. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if you know, given the fact that they, uh, you know, they've they've done little endorsements for it, little commercials, you know, spots that you hear in between songs and everything. That you know, if this channel has in effect most favored nation status, I wouldn't be surprised if. They made themselves available to it now and right. then, you know, if they have something right. to talk about. Right. And I, would, I would hope, I would hope that maybe the channel would also play their music, the son's music, you know, any family members that would give them more of a reason to go on the channel. Hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting because so far, it's, I mean, from what I, the what little time I've spent listening, they have not. At least I have. Have you, you guys heard anything? I haven't. But you know what I have heard that is not quite the Beatles and not quite a cover is they've played some original versions of the 50s things that the Beatles right. covered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, Little Eva, you know, that kind of thing. Get your hands off my baby. Take your hands off my baby. Get your hands off my baby. <laughs> Keep your hands. Keep, Keep your, your hands. hands off my baby. <laughs> they did, yeah. they, they've also played Jailhouse Rock. Right. which I thought was very interesting. Now, that was something I heard, I think, the first day. It was like, oh, okay, play us the Beatle version of that, please. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, they've been they've been doing Elvis. They've been doing, I think I heard uh, Please Don't Ever Change one day uh-huh. by the uh, oh. Everly's. So, uh, you know, they've been playing, you know, they have been going – Deep into the into the catalog there, you know, for the influences, which is kind of interesting. So that's great. I actually I, I do that on my show too, and I think that that's an important part of their history is understanding the artists that influenced them, especially mm-hmm. if they're songs that the Beatles covered, mm-hmm. uh, either as a group or in their solo careers. So uh, yeah, I love that stuff. Mm-hmm. But then uh, I I wouldn't just play any Elvis Presley song. You know, it really should be a song that they covered. Or right. at least one that they used to do live. Well, yeah, and 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 that would be the without looking at Mark Lewis's Beatles Live, um, uh, that would be the assumption with Jailhouse Rock that in fact, you know, at one point maybe in Hamburg they did do it, you know. So, and then how far do you take that? Do you also play the artists that were pre-rock and roll that uh, Ringo covered on Sentimental Journey or? You know, Paul well, you know, there, is on the bottom. You could there, do that too. Sure, and there are there is a there is a set that I saw a few years ago that had that kind of stuff. The influences, you know, Beatles influences, and I mean, it went pretty deep. Mm. Um, you know, and so I mean, yeah, there's a there's a, all sorts of places they could go. I don't think they would though, only because we're talking about a general audience, whereas with something with you know, with something like what you do, it's a more focused audience, you know, uh, more hardcore that would understand it more. Where I think people, oh. if you played, um, oh, I can't think of anything, Peggy, maybe Peggy Lee, well, not till there was you, but I mean, if you played Fever maybe or something, that they wouldn't realize, they wouldn't see the connection, you know. Hmm. Um, yeah. But. Well, I, I always try to, to make a balance in my show between appealing to casual fans and hardcore fans. And I think probably Sirius is going to do the same thing. It I would, certainly yeah, sounds like it. Yeah, it cer- certainly certainly sounds like it. Yeah, I think the the after show is kind of one link to that. And so, and also two is possibly, and I haven't heard it yet, is the uh, Chris Carter show, The Breakfast with the Beatles. So, but in any event, okay, uh, onward and upward. Uh, the next thing is kind of a little weird. People who bought tickets for for the McCartney tour in the U.S. got an email, got an, a strange email, saying you were getting a, also getting a copy of the McCartney CD. Click here, and a lot of and and the whole thing came without warning. There was no announcement, not even on on uh, McCartney website. And when this happened, when I People started talking about it. The number of people asked me, is this real? And I said, I don't know. And I contacted McCartney's representatives, and it took several days to find out, yes, it is. So if you got, if you still have those 
links to the McCartney CD you know, to getting it. If you order tickets, you can. It is safe to click onto. But it was really weird because it took an inordinate amount of time, and I really think that's something that should have been, you know, out there right away. So people don't worry about that because especially, you know, with fishing and all that kind of stuff, mm. you know, that, that's so and, – and viruses and things, that's not something that, you know, people should have had to question. Um, uh, Ken? Well, from my perspective, um, I'm excited to hear this because it means, at least the way I interpret it, that Paul's new CD will be out hopefully by the time that Paul comes to the U.S., well, it doesn't, they, which, they, didn't, they didn't tell you when you were going to get the CD, though. No, it says when it becomes available, but eh, right. it, it kind of makes sense that it would be out when he tours. So there's no guarantee of that. And, um, you know, I knew it was for real because I got the email myself from Ticketmaster about it. And they asked for my mailing address. So, uh, yeah, this this is definitely happening. So um, And also... I remember Prince did the same thing on one of his tours. He offered the CD with the ticket purchase. And I think sometimes maybe the artist might be doing this to help drive the sales and maybe to have a better chart showing. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Don't know for a fact if that was the motivation behind this, but I think it's very smart to do that. You know, I remember. I think, I think, you, can, I think you can probably uh, go along with that. I think that, especially given what happened to him last time with the disappointing chart, you know, uh, situation with New. I think that's probably very likely. We were talking well, about before we started that that if all these if all these uh, uh, giveaways count as sales, then you know that's a good you know that's a good number right there, and and then count up uh, all the sales you know on top of it that will happen to the general public once it goes out into the stores you know go ahead yeah, i don't know if you would call new uh, disappointing in sales because it did chart as high as number three on uh, the album charts but i remember at the time when we were doing our show together just you and me steve i was talking about the fact that if everybody who went to see paul live at that time had bought the CD, he probably would have had a number one CD. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? So there's a lot of people that go to see Paul live who are young fans, don't really know his solo stuff, might only know his Beatles and a few select classic solo tunes, who might not think about buying his new CD. And now they get it with the ticket, mm-hmm. which is a great idea. So um, it will give them reason to check out the music if they probably weren't thinking about getting it anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see where that goes. It would be great if they got the CD before the concert, so they could become <laughs> familiar with the songs. So right, right. Well, we'll see what happens. We don't know when the album is coming out, and the the first U.S. show is uh, I believe early in July. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's July seventh yeah. in Miami. So we will see. We will see. We will see. Do you imagine it will be out by then? Wouldn't we have heard? You would. Uh, and when you put I, it that close to this Pepper release, um, yeah, I, that's. A, I mean, that's a good point. And 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 given today, you know, we're taping this on May twenty second, and there's been no word, and that's only a month and a half. So the most recent reports I heard was that he was halfway done. With in the which album. case, in which case, it will not be out by the time. The tour starts. Mm-hmm. If that's accurate, if those reports are accurate. Right. right. But he does have the month of June when he's not booked, and he's got the month of August when he's not booked for any live shows. So I would think if he hasn't finished the album, he'd probably finish it up in those months. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see. But I, I mean, it's an interesting experiment for him. Um, Alan, you were mentioning earlier when we were talking before the show that Dylan does it has done it too. Yeah, Dylan did it with his tour last summer, and the album came, as I recall, way after the tour. I mean, you know, it it, it wasn't, it, it certainly wasn't before the show, if I recall correctly, and uh, I I think it was a bit after. So it was just sort of a a nice little blandishment, you know, that you you bought the concert ticket and got the album too i thought it, i thought it was a nice touch was so, it a cd or a download it was a cd okay 
because I've this has never happened to me. I I, I don't go to that many shows. So, <laughs> but, okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay, well we'll see what we'll see how that how that uh, happens. Um, next on the list, last week was the reissue. I guess you could call it reissue of the Bayonets Crash Boom Bang album with two added tracks and. Ken, you and I both talked to Brian Ray mm. in advance of the release, and I mean, anyone who's heard the album knows that they're basically a, a down-to-earth rock and roll band. Um, they have a lot of influences in, you know, in in basic rock and roll, including the Beatles, but you know, Elvis and Aerosmith uh, and you know, the Kinks, and there's a lot of there's mm. a lot of influences there. And Brian was, you know, very excited about this. What happened was that um, Marty Scott, who runs Gem Records, got interested in the album and approached Brian about um, reissuing the album. And he and he asked him to record two new tracks, which they did, and they t- and they uh, they put them on the album. And the album, I mean, I liked the album before. I like it even more now. It's a it's a lot of fun to listen to. Hmm. So, yeah. uh, uh, it, uh, if you know, if you haven't heard the album, I think Brian has. There's some stuff online on YouTube, but it's a fun. It's really a fun album to listen to, and I don't say that very lightly. It, it really, really is. Uh, it really is a fun album. Uh, Ken, what do you want to say? Well, I think the album is just a great mix of strong rock and roll and uh, a strong R and B uh, feel. And um, I know that I said to Brian that when I listen to this album, it reminds me of of Aerosmith a bit. And Steven Tyler, by the way, is on one song. Right. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah that, I was going to mention that. Go ahead. And, um, and also kind of like a more polished 70s Jay Giles feel. Really? So that's, that's how I kind of, yeah, some of the songs are like that. All the songs have great hooks, and it's really difficult for me to pick a favorite. But, um, you know, I programmed two of the songs from the Bayonets album on my syndicated show for every little thing. And uh, Crash Boom Bang, the title track, was one of them. And the, the guitar riff in there sounds like it could have been from Dirty Water, mm-hmm. you know, from the Standells. Mm-hmm. But Brian mm-hmm. said to me it's closer to uh, Everybody Needs Somebody to Love, which the ah. Rolling Stones covered. Right. So I, I could see that now. But when I first heard that, it's like, oh, this sounds like Dirty Water to me. But um, the second song on the album is Killer. It's called So Easy Rider, which reminds me a lot of, like, uh, Deep Purple, Space Trucking. Hmm. Um, okay. So, I mean, all the songs really have uh, a lot of edge to them, uh, a lot of hooks. It's just good, fun rock and roll. And every song is solid, you know. And he also wrote songs with Oliver Lieber, who is the, uh, the son of... Um, Jerry Lieber of Mike Stoller and Jerry Lieber fame, mm-hmm. and uh, and the two of them, uh, you know, have written a number of songs together on, on the album, and they really are uh, very catchy songs and very accessible for rock radio. Mm-hmm. And that's where the group came together. Is basically, according to what Brian told me, it was basically Oliver's idea, because I think Brian had a, a another solo album in the works and. Uh, and Oliver said, "Why don't we do a, a group?" And and they did, and they got, uh, and then they got uh, Lucretia, uh, who the uh, the woman who plays uh, guitar as the third member, and and they took off. And yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a great, it's really is a great album. Uh, it really, yeah. really is. Yeah, so, she's from Argentina. Right, and, and Brian met her. Brian knew her from when he toured South America. Because mm-hmm. he did that solo tour of South America. Uh, one thing that they point up in their in the the press release a lot um, is that it's gotten a lot of good response from um, Steve Van Zandt's uh, Underground Garage. Mm-hmm. It's been, I guess, a couple of songs have been named coolest songs. But I mean, it's just a, it's just uh, I mean, all that aside, it's just a great album. It really it really is. It's a it's a rock and good album. It's one of these uh, you know. You know, put down the top on your car, turn up the volume, and and take off albums. It really yeah. is. Yeah, um, it's it's great for the car. <laughs> it is. 
the, the last news item we have here is uh, this Friday is the premiere of the new Pirates uh, of the Caribbean album, Dead Men Tell No Tales. And as Paul McCartney made it well known last weekend was known actually before this, he has a cameo in it, I guess as a jailer. At least that's what the picture looks like. And that's what I've heard some people say, although I have not seen the picture. However, on my recent trip to Disneyland, they had a 14-minute preview of the film playing in California Adventure. And it's I guess it's still there if you're in the area. But Paul is not in the preview. But the preview is, is in 3D, and it looks wonderful, I have to say. I know that the, the last couple of movies were not the best. They were kind of a little boring, but uh, but uh, the preview on this one looks really good. It's another one of those things where uh, something rolls through the uh, the street and uh, – and Johnny Depp is uh, on top of it uh, again. And uh, but this is but it was fun. It was uh, it was fun to watch. In fact, I sat through it four times. Well, because it was free and because it was easy to get into, as opposed to the long lines to all the rides in Disneyland. But <laughs> I'm just saying that uh, you know, at least from the 14 minute preview, and I assume again it was the beginning of the film. It looks like it's going to be fun. So there we go. Okay. We're now going to talk about what we came to talk about, and that's the Sgt. Pepper box set, which we've been all digging our teeth into. And I guess the first thing to talk about is the mix. And I I like the mix. I, I thought it's it's very clean. I've heard some people say they thought it was kind of muddy. I didn't think so at all. Mm. I thought the I thought the song sounded really good. I love the 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 one thing that of course really caught my ear after Alan mentioned it a couple of weeks ago was the difference in Lucy in the Sky which is beautiful. I mean it really when you hear that for the first time you just kind of go wow cuz it it's so it is so different. Um but uh gentlemen why don't you go ahead and, and uh Alan I'm going to let you start this time. What do you think? I know you did a big piece for the Wall Street Journal. Right, yeah. Um, and I just today pretty much finished up a bigger piece for Beatle Fan um, uh-huh. with very little overlap, actually. Yeah, I generally speaking really like the new mix. Um, it's, you know, b- we've talked about the whole thing with uh, people seem to be still confused about it, but how can you go back to the individual tracks if they only had four track? And then, you know, okay, you know, EMI had saved all of the reels of tape, you know, from before they were, before the reduction mixes were done. In 67, they did the reduction mixes so that they could free up more tracks to have to add extra instruments. And once those reduction mixes were done, George Martin was basically stuck with that reduction mix as part of, you know, what he could manipulate in making particularly a stereo image. I mean, in mono, it doesn't matter that much because even if you've got this pre-mixed section, you're, you're mixing the other new additions and the pre-mix section to mono, things don't have to be put in different places. But now, having those things untangled and all those original recordings as, as separate tracks rather than as bounced down and mixed together tracks gave Giles um, an awful lot of freedom that his father didn't have in making the stereo mix. And it also gave him really better quality tracks to work with because all those bounce down tracks were copied and then copied again. And each time you lose a little quality. So we're Mm -hmm. starting off with like really clean raw materials. And, you know, that in itself is like, I think I said this when the One Plus album came out, that itself is a good reason to remix you know, all this stuff now, because you can now do things that you couldn't do in 67 because of the reduction mixes. In addition, he gave a lot more energy to the bass and drums. I mean, there are aspects of the sort of lower end of this recording that you don't even hear on the original, you know, but Mm -hmm. obviously they were playing. And if you go back to the original and really kind of, 
listen closely, the stuff's there. But um, right. you know, now it's now it's really got a lot of energy. I felt that um, that did make it a little heavier sounding than the original. And there are a couple of places where that took a slight toll, I think. I think between that and the compression used on the vocal tracks, I thought the vocal tracks lost some suppleness that they had in the original mono and stereo mixes. But mm. on the CD version of this, you know, if you, li- if you compare the old mono or stereo, and you might as well do the mono since it's at least in the same key as the new one. If you compare the old version and new version of She's Leaving Home, Paul sounds on the old one like, you know, like he's singing a very kind of supple vocal line, whereas that's squeezed a bit out of it on the CD version of the new mix. I did listen to the LP of the new mix, which to me sounded warmer and fuller and as if and 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 the vocal compression didn't seem to be as much of a problem it sounded to me a lot more like the old vocal sound so who knows what what the problem there is whether it's the compression used for the cd was different than for the lp i i don't know but um yeah, I mean, I, I generally like the mix. There, there are some interesting differences, too, in Within You, Without You. At the end of the instrumental solo, the sort of Indian back and forth uh, that goes on for a while, there's, you know, Harrison is playing sitar on that, and he plays this little sitar lick at the very end of, of the solo section that on the... 1967 mono and stereo mixes is really kind of buried. You can hear it if you look for it, but it's, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't stand out. Now it stands out and I like it. You know, it's a really nice little touch. Now you could argue that that's a compositional decision and that if George wanted it lower in the mix, it should be lower in the mix. I don't know. You know, I like hearing it. It's, um, you know, he played it and um, it works. And and the other thing like that is the final chord of a day in the life. It comes on to me. Uh, I don't know, your your mileage may differ, but to me, it sounds much louder when it comes crashing in than it did on the 1967 mixes. And so it's it's kind of really more, yeah, it's kind of more dramatic. You know, you hear the orchestral build up and then. Um, the, the 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 piano chord crash is actually louder than the orchestra was. I'm gonna have to listen to that again because I, I yeah. the the impression I got was was a little different. I I thought it fit in better, hmm. um, but I'm gonna have to I, I'll have to listen to that again. Yeah, listen uh, again. on that <laughs> on that basis. Um, but uh, okay, Ken, what 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 do you think? Well, I'm making notes of everything that you're saying here, Alan. So when I, <laughs> when I go back and listen, I want to listen specifically for what you're bringing up here. But um, yeah. I had a couple of weeks longer than you, so. <laughs> yes, you did. But um, pretty much a lot of what I said when I went to the, the listening party for this still holds about the clarity of everything. And um, I've listened to the stereo remix on my little computer speakers. I've listened in the car. I've listened with headphones on, and I can pretty much say that, you know, almost the same thing, that the clarity is astounding throughout. The one thing I did notice, and and this also comes from many years of listening to the stereo mix and not really spending as much time as you probably think I should have with the original mono, but um, I noticed a lot more harmonies, especially on the title track and with a little help from my friends coming through my headphones. I don't know if you guys felt that. I heard more detail in picking out John, Paul, and George there in the harmonies. Did you guys hear that? Not that I, I, I mean, like I said, Lucy in the Sky here, you know, with that with that background did seem a little more harmonic than before, but uh, I didn't notice it on the others. Hmm. But, well, in particular, the first two songs I noticed that on. Um, mm-hmm. Within You, Without You blows me away. Mm-hmm. Not not just the clarity, but it's just so clean. I mean, you hear everything on that song. Mm-hmm. And in particular, with the headphones on, I know I brought up the drums in Lovely Rita. When the song kicks in, the first uh, note on, on the drums there is just so powerful. <laughs> you know, you never heard it that way. 
mm. uh, before. The bass and the drums really benefit from the new mix, and many people have said that, and it's very evident. This, I hear a lot more bass in certain songs. Um, but, you know, overall, I'm just very impressed with the clarity of it all. That's what I've noticed. And just knowing, like you said, the way that this whole thing was done by using the original tracks, not having to do all the reduction mixes, makes a big difference. Because I always remember when the 87 CDs came out that Sgt. Pepper sounded a little too hissy already. It didn't sound that powerful listening to the CD in, in 87. Of course, a lot has changed since then with the 2009 remasters. But, um, you know, that's basically what I've come across feeling from the new remix. Mm-hmm. I'm very impressed by the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But I also need to, to go back and listen to the original mono to fully understand, you know, whether this is an improvement. You know, there are certain songs, by the way, like Good Morning, Good Morning really hits you in your face. There's just so much sound coming at you all at once. So I don't know if that benefits from the new stereo mix or if it's better in the, the original mono. But, um, yeah, I noticed that with, with certain songs where there's a lot of sound coming from different sources. And even maybe to some degree being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, it's very clear. And I love the clarity and the brightness of it. But it's just, when you can single out all the different instrumentation and you can hear it so clearly... Mm-hmm. That's what makes it all the more worthwhile. Yeah. Did the two of you feel that way about those two songs that I just brought up? Because Good Morning, Good Morning is really, it's very loud. <laughs> yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. All, all these- that, may have, that may have been a little too loud. I yeah. think that, that, may have been, that may have been one that was a little too loud. I mean, the ones that stuck out for me were Fixing a Hole and She's Leaving Home. And especially, she's leaving home, especially after listening to the outtakes. I, I, I don't want to get too far ahead, but the outtakes on She's Leaving Home are tremendous. I mean, that with the back, with the violins and everything. Oh, my God. That's like a religious experience. <laughs> It, it it that was that was beautiful, but uh, but it's things like that. The the outtake the uh, with a little help is great. You know, uh, getting better has always been one of my favorite songs of you know of uh, my favorite Beatles song. Period, especially with with uh, Paul's ba- what Paul does with the bass there, and listening to that was uh, I, I, again a, you know it was it was beautiful. It was fantastic. So. Hmm. And it was interesting. It was interesting. I talked to Giles Martin, and I, we're going to try and include some of that uh, in this two-part show. But it was interesting hearing him talk about, you know, what their, uh, how they work things, and and uh, saying, for example, on three, on, with a little help from my friends, how when they were trying to move Ringo's voice around, if you moved it to the right, it didn't sound great, and it sounded better in the center. Um, that was, you know, uh, uh, that was kind of interesting. Uh, so they, you know, they they did a lot of experimentation in this, and uh, you know, for the most part, it sounds pretty good, I think. Yeah, that's so. another thing. I've never been a big fan of lead vocals in one channel. Mm-hmm. You know, it. Um, I think it kind of weakens the song, and so when the vocals are centered, I think it's much more powerful. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they made adjustments in the mix with the with the new stereo remix, and I think right. it sounds much better that way. And there's been there have been comments on Facebook about from some people about why bother, you know, and they and it should be pointed out, and they've and it's been said, you know, all the way through since this thing, this thing was announced that this is not replacing the original. 2009 remaster mix right um and there was something that you brought up ken we should I, I'd, I'd like to have us all talk about this as to whether this in any way takes away from the original mix and ken since you brought it up first i'm going to let you i'm going to let you have at it first um what do you think <laughs> it doesn't take away at all you know i can apply this not just to sergeant pepper but any uh, anything else that's come out in the past like let it be naked or the love cd or whatever it's just another way of listening to the music and as long as you always have the original recordings they're available as long as they're not removed from the catalog to me that's revisionism 
you know, if you remove that from the catalog and you only have the new mixes available, you're forcing people to accept it a certain way. This is just another way of listening to it. Um, and if anything, for people who have been craving anything outside of those versions that we've come to know and love from the entire Beatle catalog, who want to hear something different, who want to hear how a song evolved, you know, and maybe some instrumentation in particular, and it really applies to Sgt. Pepper here, instrumentation that got buried in the mix, here you can hear so much more that you never heard before. In particular, mm -hmm. even though we're jumping a bit here, but there's a particular outtake of Getting Better where you hear the tambora, which is mm -hmm. you know an instrument that I knew was in the song, and I knew that there's a couple of bars before the last verse of Getting Better where you hear that drone from the tambora. But when you listen to this mix, the southern mix, it's throughout the entire song. Right. <laughs> and I never knew that before. Hmm. Yeah. So, no, I know I know what you're talking I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That was pretty cool to hear that. Yeah, so it's it's I think that for people who want to study this stuff, who really want to know after all these years how do the Beatles do all this? This is, you know, a way of learning that. You know, <laughs> We're not getting every take of every song. I'm sure there are some people amongst us that would like to have every single take. Me. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but these are, I guess, the essential ones, you know, and uh, I don't think this takes away at all. You don't lose anything from the originals, you know, as long as they're always out there, there's no harm done. Mm -hmm. Which does bring up an interesting point about not having everything. I did look at the track list of the... Um I believe it's, is it the Darth disc? The six disc uh, deluxe? Is that a Darth disc? Or, or pur that's Purple Chick, I'm sorry. Purple Chick. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Alan, talking bootlegs on this show. There have been projects out there of bootlegs that have done, you know, have gathered as many outtakes of Sgt. Pepper as they could possibly find. And the Beatles have, have dug up stuff that that uh, you know that we haven't heard before, and the one interesting thing about the uh, outtakes too is, although a lot of them, a lot of it's available are in stereo, not all of them were, and in this case, you know, I think most of them are. So I think actually most of the outtakes we have not heard before. I mean, it, it, the things that are on anthology. Those are sort of Frankenstein versions right. of multiple mm. takes, and so right. we've heard of you know a bit of some of, of some of the takes here, but not the whole thing because it was edited onto a different take, or a vocal was flown in, or an instrumental line right. was flown in. On the anthology, I mean, I think that had a different purpose. I think the idea was to sort of give us an impression of how the songs developed in the studio and to give us a really completely listenable and playable on the radio outtake. Whereas mm -hmm. with these, they gave us the actual outtakes without messing about, um, complete with talking before and after in a lot of cases – and uh, and and really no editing or flying in or making what bootleg collectors call outfakes, and they say that you know partly pejoratively and partly not because a lot of people like outfakes. You know, a lot of interesting mm. creative stuff can be done with outfakes, but nevertheless, you know, from from Apple, who has access to the whole recorded catalog of of sessions, we kind of want to hear the real thing. Um, right, and so even where there were um, examples of things that were more or less complete on anthology, I'm thinking of Strawberry Fields Forever, Take One, for instance. This is a completely different mix. Um, on Strawberry Fields, Take One on anthology, George Martin left out the harmony vocals on the last verse, which. I've always really loved. I mean, always since they first leaked out after the 1983 Abbey Road show where they were played and someone mm -hmm. snuck out a recording of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always thought that sounded just gorgeous, and he didn't include it on anthology, possibly because it was an overdub and he was presenting the take pre-overdub. You know, that could be the reasoning there. But mm. I think having it in there is a big improvement. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of like the mixes of the outtakes. I think they uh, they're, they're really revealing. 
Lucy in the Sky, take one, that chorus, you know, the, cho- the vocals are on there uh, until the chorus, each time the chorus comes up, and then it's just instrumental. And to me, that sounds like a classic 60s garage band, you know, with the organ and everything mm-hmm. <laughs> prominent. Mm. It just sounds like, you know, like a garage band. It was just the last thing I'd have imagined Lucy could sound like. Now when I listen to the finished track, yeah, I hear it back there. <laughs> but, you know, you usually focus more on those vocals during the chorus, right? And uh and uh let's see what else. I mean, within you without fixing you. a fixing a hole where he where he goes tailing off at the end. Fixing a hole, fixing a hole. I th- I thought that was very yeah. very different yeah. there's a lot of stuff that i think I, I think it's similar to what i said when we were talking about the paul and elvis demos where you hear paul trying out different approaches in the studio while doing you know uh, making his way towards the finished version with fixing a hole you hear a lot of that you hear a lot of phrasing that he eventually decided not to do but some of which was really interesting Within you, without you, you know, you hear George talking to the Indian musicians about what he wants. I mean, that's really kind of revealing. That's one of the most fascinating parts of this whole collection to me because he's singing the parts to them. Yeah. And he's actually singing it. It sounds like these are Indian words. Well, it's he, it's probably an Indian solfege system. You know, the way we would say do, re, mi, he's using the Indian equivalents. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. I hadn't realized that. Mm. But I found that really interesting. It kind of reminded me of, um, you know, on Wonderwall Music, they had a bonus track when it was remastered recently, George instructing the Indian musicians on the inner light. Right. Yeah. And so, that was, that was like, just in plain English, right? I mean, that is yeah. article. Yeah. And how did you like hearing Within You Without You with just the Indian instruments? I like that. I thought that was yeah, good. I, 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 that that was out before though, wasn't it? No, uh, on anthology it was both the Indian instruments and the Western instruments. Is that what it was? Um, okay. Yeah, it just didn't have the vocal. Okay. So that mm. gives us yet another perspective of within you, without you. So we've now mm-hmm. got there. Yeah. You were talking about fixing a hole. That particular take, which was take three, you hear Paul playing the harpsichord in the middle. Right. He's doing like a solo part. Mm-hmm. So I found that to be interesting. Lovely Rita. You know, sometimes when you when you have a song and there's one part missing, it makes a big difference. And sometimes it gives it more of a live feel. Like with Fixing a Hole, uh, take one is without the lead guitar. And there's no, um, there's no reverb on Paul's voice. It's very dry. Um, so just without having the lead guitar, it gives it a different feel. Mm-hmm. And Lovely Rita didn't have harmonies on it. No bass. No piano solo on there, and uh, you hear George Martin's piano uh, playing uh, near uh, at the end of the song. Mm-hmm. So it actually it, it feels more live. You know, it's a more raw take, and it's exciting that way. It's it's incredible how you just remove one instrument or even just a few, and it makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Getting back to what what we were saying, what uh, we were originally talking about, though, <laughs> Alan, do you feel do you feel the reworking of the album takes away from the original at all? Uh, no, because as, as, as Ken said, the original's still there. You can always go to the original if you want it. Um, you know, this is just another version that you can hear if you want that. And uh, mm-hmm. I don't know, I, I imagine I'll be switching through all three of them uh, when I feel like listening pretty much the same way as I've always switched between mono and stereo. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, my my feeling is, I mean, I don't know that I would want this done with every album, but we're t- we're not talking about every album. I would, um, I'd want it done with every album. <laughs> well, I'm not talking about every. I'm talking about every album. Period. Not just every Beatle album. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. There's a whole lot of albums I don't care about. That I don't... <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Right, but in this particular case, with the with a you know with a Beatle album that especially is as iconic as this one, you know, I mean, you learn a lot by by listening to this. So. Yeah, here's the thing. I mean, sometimes you get to a point where technology allows you to do stuff that you couldn't have done at the time that you might have 
wanted to do at the time, you know, and I think that it's not a bad thing to take care, to to take advantage of that technology. It's not as if you're saying, well, the technology allows us to add disco beats and, you know, make these mm-hmm. into dance tracks. They're basically making the Sgt. Pepper album as we knew it and loved it but with the kind of clarity that you could get if you were doing it now and the kind of bass and drum power that you could get if you were doing it now. I mean, you know, we know from Paul and Paul's complaints in particular, but all of them complained at various times over the years in interviews that they wanted more bass. They'd always bring in these Motown records and say, why can't you do that? And EMI would always say, well, we don't want people's record players skipping so we have to attenuate the bass a bit and it was always less than they wanted so now you know we know what they wanted we know that what you're getting now um i don't really see a problem with it yeah you know uh, what's I, what oh, well, i was just going to make one quick comment and then i'll let you i'll let you can i was going to say it would have been interesting if one of them had suggested you know god i wish we could throw it you know pull everything apart and and play around with this a little more to you know the way they did um back then it would have been that would have been very uh, very interesting ken go ahead yeah i just wanted to say that the question that you're asking here steve actually stems from a post that elliot easton put on facebook elliot easton the guitarist in the cars um, Mm -hmm. who is a huge beale fan by the way but I just want to read what he wrote here, and it's, it's interesting because this, this resulted in a long thread on uh, my Facebook page. He wrote, is anyone else tire, tiring of the unending refurbishing of the Beatles catalog? Personally, I feel that the mixing of an album is part of the performance in a studio setting. And being in the moment, just carrying on from having recorded, is the purest distillation of what was captured on tape. Remixing it 50 years later, repackaging with outtakes, never intended for release, I feel that it diminishes the purity of the final product. I can't imagine a better sound than the original mono mix of Peppers. There isn't one. And that's why we're bringing up this subject. But, um, you know, actually one of my Facebook friends responded very well by saying that if the Beatles had 16 tracks to work with in 1967, they probably would have done what Giles Martin just did. You know, so they used what they had at the time to the best of their ability, and now we're just doing the same thing with those recordings. It's interesting so. that a musician brought that up because, you know, if somebody had said, you know, if somebody came to the cars and said, we want to take one of your albums and do a complete remixing, would he object to that? Apparently. You know, uh, yeah, apparently he would, and I'm, and, mm. and that's too bad because – it would have been. I mean, the cars. I mean, the cars. I'm um, not to get, you know, take uh, start talking about the cars a lot, but I mean, they had a great sound. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and one of their uh, a remix on one of their albums, especially now, from what it, where are we talking? The Twenty years. Oh, more um, than that. I'm, it's late seventies through late the seventies. Yeah. Right. So I mean, a, a remix on one of their albums might be to their advantage, and it's interesting that he doesn't particularly think so so well whatever you know recording is always <laughs> full of compromises it just it just is you know mm-hmm. and you are always even you know now people feel limited by what you can do and you can do almost anything now and i'm also surprised that a musician wouldn't be interested in going back and saying let me see if i can get closer to what my vision for this album was and you know let's not forget that paul and ringo have approved this mix right and that's one thing that's one thing that that giles mentioned to me because i asked him specifically i said how they feel about it and he said if they didn't approve it it wouldn't be out yeah so that's you know, you can take that for whatever it is, but yeah, if they didn't approve it, it wouldn't be out. So, there of you course, go. you can always make the argument that part of the appeal and why why we are fascinated with the Beatles is because of the mystery of it all, how they achieve what they did. The more that gets stripped away, then maybe you know it kind of ruins things in a way. Mm, Not for me, but it doesn't. But some really. people, some people may feel that way. Hmm. Well, I think you know. I think you can get carried away a little bit, and, and to not to 
put down the bootleggers, but I mean, with some of the stuff that comes out on bootleg, I mean, I don't even pay attention to it all because, you know, you can get, you can get crazy picking out, you know, uh, or taking things apart. And they and they've done that, and and to, in some cases it's worked out very nicely, as I I think I mentioned, or as as you know, as probably some of our listeners know, this putting a mono mix in stereo has been done by the bootleggers. This is not something brand new, but the fact that the Beatles did it, the fact that they have authorized this, the fact that they've gone back to the original source material and done it, is a monumental thing mm-hmm. um and i i in fact i don't know of any and alan may, maybe you can help me out i don't know of any artist that has done anything like this i can't think of one well can other you? artists have allowed people to come in and mix their stuff i mean a lot of progressive rock bands are getting steve wilson in particular to redo their catalog i mean um jethro tull several albums yes several well I'm, t- albums. I'm talking about i'm talking about going back to the mono mix like like they did like the beatles did here well i don't they went back to the multi-track masters and kept the mono characteristics in mind but it's not like they took the mono mix and did anything to it you know yeah. what what the bootlegs you're talking about we're talking about taking a mono mix and using you know various eq and computer technology to kind of strip things out so that you can place them in a different part of the image but that's different than actually having the multi-track tapes and right oh yeah obviously doing it. yeah obviously. so i don't know and if I, any and and that's why this is significant because of that because of that very reason. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know of any other bands who've said, you know, we preferred the mono mix and now we're going to make a stereo mix of the mono mix, you know, like that. I, I can't think of any who've done it. But, um, yeah, who? I mean, who would it be, actually? there. Were, I mean, there were a lot of people. If you, if you collect an artist and it's an artist from that long ago where they were putting out things in mono and stereo, you often get fascinated by the different mixes. I mean, I've read articles about Bowie's different mixes and, you know, the Stones have some and, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, but I haven't seen anyone go back and, but I also haven't seen anyone arguing that, you know, the mono is the superior mix and therefore we want to incorporate those characteristics into a new stereo mix, which is What's happening here? Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, we could talk. We could talk about the the, mo- the mono versus stereo Rolling Stones. Um, the one really good example of that is Satisfaction. Oh. The stereo mix is horrible. For I that. agree. I mean, absolutely disgusting. I like it. Uh, <laughs> do you really? <laughs> yeah. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, I think that. I, I mean, I, lo- I normally love stereo mixes, but I can't listen to that one. Really, especially with the, with the guitar, the way the guitar, uh, where the where I guess that's Keith's guitar comes in there. I mean, it's hard. I think that's terrible. Yeah, but you can hear some things that you can't hear in the mono mix, so it's, no, it's interesting. I agree to with I agree with that. You that you can, but I think the sound overall of that mix is just is just horrible. Um, I agree with I, you, Steve. And, and you can't hear the vocals. You know, it's more like. Right, and that's it's like why, karaoke. It's like you know, <laughs> and that's why the the mono mixes on the Stones. You know, a, a lot of them. I mean, that's why that mono album box of the Stones albums that came out last year was fantastic, and it mm-hmm. really is. Yeah. So, anyway, Alan, let's talk. Uh, let's talk again about the about the vinyl uh, version and the second disc with the with the outtakes. Uh, yeah, the, I think uh, they've done. Uh, uh, I set up a an outtake uh, version uh, taken from the CDs, but you did it. Uh, but you've listened to the actual second disc that will be on the two disc CD right. set. Uh, yeah, and you want to talk about the differences there? Or yeah, you- I have. I have the LP version of the what they call the deluxe edition, um, and we've been focusing on the super deluxe edition, which is the six mm-hmm. disc set. And it's 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 kind of interesting what they did because on the six disc set the two discs of outtakes are sequenced kind of chronologically according to you know when the earliest recording date of a particular song is so it starts with Strawberry Fields and then you've got and you know in Penny Lane and uh, when I'm 64 and a day in life it's sort of done mm-hmm. in in the order the sessions went which is really interesting 
if you, you know, you follow, say, you know, Mark Lewison's Recording Sessions book and you're, you're seeing the way the album, you know, evolved as they were doing it and then they resequenced it for the actual release. On the deluxe edition, the two disc set, of which I have just the vinyl version, I don't have the CD version, apart from the three tracks you can get from iTunes. Of, you know. Which, yeah, um, we, should, we should mention for anybody listening to this before Friday, is that you can pick up six tracks total. Yeah, oh, t- three from the remix and three from disc two. If you mm-hmm. if you order the iTunes version, they'll give you those as advances. And disc two, what they've done is they've sequenced it in the order of you know the album as it as it plays rather than chronological order. So basically, it is an alternative pepper on disc two. And to me, the funny thing about it is that when I play it, I mean, it, you know, they. They've chosen, you know, obviously just one track from one outtake from each song, and they end it with uh, the day in the life with the vocal ohm final chord. But they use take one on the six disc set. They edit that chord onto take two, so it's a slightly different edit there. That's no big deal. But what I found kind of interesting about the alternate pepper. Uh, thing is that in first of all in a lot of cases they're instrumentals but they have the quality of a let it be bootleg in the sense that you know you're getting the chatter before and after the songs Mm -hmm. you're getting very unfinished versions where they're sort of making their way towards the finished version so it's as if it's a let it be bootleg except it's all pepper stuff which Mm -hmm. To me, actually, is having having heard a great many, many Let It Be bootlegs, I, I found this a refreshing, uh, refreshing alternative to that. Because to me, it's uh, better yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, I, li- I like the, I like that too. <laughs> okay. I actually like the fact that you you can listen both ways. You can listen in the sequence of the way that it was on the album on one disc, and yep. you can listen in the way that they recorded it, which is fascinating yeah. to itself. If well, you, if you buy both versions. Yeah. yeah, if you buy both, both versions, right. Ken, uh, did you have something to say about this? Oh, it's just a wonderful collection, all these outtakes. There's so many things that I found fascinating. Not just the things that I mentioned already, but for example, when I'm 64, the one outtake that's on, uh, it's actually on disc two, it actually plays at the normal speed, which is a little bit slower than the one that we're used to on the album. Mm-hmm. And we've heard all these many years that Paul... At least that's what's written in all the books, is that Paul wanted his vocals to be sped up a little bit so he would sound younger. Hmm. Well, you know, this is the way that it was recorded before it was adjusted to that. And there's a few songs on Sgt. Pepper where they played with the speed. Like, for example, She's Leaving Home, which uh, up until recently I didn't know until Giles Martin said it. That's how Paul wanted it. So that's really the version. It's not like um, that was a mistake and the stereo version was the one that was the real version, the way it was supposed to go out. That's the way Paul wanted it. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, I loved hearing just the backing tracks on Penny Lane uh, with no bass, no drums. It's a different take, but it's just interesting to hear that. And what I really found fascinating was right after that, they had vocal overdubs for Penny Lane and, um, you know, working out the harmonies on that song and hearing George Mm -hmm. sing his part. It's just really, you know, fun to hear that. And also, you know, adding hand claps and stuff like that to the song. Mm-hmm. You know, singing, have- actually hearing the backing tracks and singing along to them. Mm-hmm. And he, Paul's actually singing the trumpet part. You know, right. That, that was really interesting. You know, what was interesting about that is that we hear an awful lot from people who follow the Beatles peripherally, who have no problem giving their opinion that all the interesting stuff the Beatles did was George Martin. But you hear Paul singing the arrangement here, and I don't think Mm. he's singing what George taught him. I think he's singing what he wanted Mm. that that part to be. So I thought that was really an interesting thing, too, because we kind of know the the debate about what George Martin did and didn't do. He did an awful lot. But it, it simply is not true 
to say that he did absolutely everything, even in the orchestral arrangements. You know, Paul mm-hmm. knew what he wanted, and and you know, and 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 George Martin has said so. You know, All right. So that's a great yeah. moment of it. You know, Paul singing that that trumpet part, and or, you know, that some of the instrumental backing that's eventually going to be added. I thought that yeah. was great. Yeah, not only that, but one of the takes of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, uh, take five it was, you actually hear Paul at the very beginning giving John direction mm-hmm. on how to sing it. Right. He wanted him to sing it quicker, you know? It sounded more like a guide vocal, you know, up until then. So just to hear that, where we're being witness here to the session and what went on there, which, you know, up until now, you know, this, these are private moments of what went on in the studio. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, a Day in the Life is really interesting. Those two takes, takes one and two, no drums. Right. I mean, the drums are such a big part of that song. Some of Ringo's best drumming, you could say, is on A Day in the Life. But to hear it without the drums gives it, a, you know, a different feel altogether. I wonder how many people. I wonder how many people are going to hear a Sugar Plum Fairy, Sugar Plum Fairy, mm-hmm. for the first time. <laughs> yeah. Also, those two backing tracks for "She's Leaving Home" are really wonderful. Like you said, Steve. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're works of art just by themselves without hearing mm-hmm. Paul singing. You know, and they actually use the first take in there, but the the other take is just gorgeous. Yeah. You know, to hear the harp with the string instruments is it's you know it's like. You know, a classical piece of music mm-hmm. by itself, standing by itself. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you realize when you've got a backing like that that's that works without even having the vocals, that's something really special right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then there are some nice touches in that arrangement that you don't really hear when you listen to the full track because you're focusing on the vocals. But mm-hmm. hearing them on their own, you hear some nice little turns going on, especially at the end. And of course, there are those couple of bars of cello music in both of those outtakes that in the end they decided to cut out little cello transitions. Mm. And it obviously went as far as the mixing, because where they give on disc four after the original mono mix, they have an early mix of uh, of She's Leaving Home, which still has those cello bars in it. Mm-hmm. So they must have actually just said, you know what, don't like that, taking a razor blade and cut them out. Hmm. You know? Yeah. So all, apparently, these things, apparently, all these things tell us so much about how they worked, you know, that's, that's the great right. thing about it. Yeah. So I Elliot wish Easton they had, apparently, Yeah. <laughs> really. I love apparently, him. He's a, he's a big Beatle fan. He's a big George Harrison fan. So okay. Apparently they used a needle drop on the Penny Lane promo. I wish they had... I wish they had found that uh, tape somewhere. Yeah. It's not as uh, if it's unlistenable, you know. It's just a little bit muddier than you hoped it would be. Right. But This is uh, – uh, what's really going to be interesting is how much it sells. If it goes to number one on the on the charts, which I suspect it will, given the advanced sales, because it's been – it's still, I believe, in the top ten on Amazon – in pre-sales so this thing is going to i mean and and that answers the you know kind of gives a uh answer to the question of whether they'll do this again because if this makes as much money as it looks like it's going to there's a uh you know you uh, you don't have to bet no on this one i think there's a good i think there's a good chance i mean i'll think we don't know what they're going to do i mean obviously but i think you know it's a favorable Things looking favorable that something will happen down the road. Yeah, yeah. probably. I hope so. And the impression that I got from Jeff Jones at that at that uh, party for Sergeant Pepper was that they are listening to what the fans are saying. They are listening to social media. So I think the smart thing that Apple should do is is you know mix having releases for mainstream fans and then mix that with the more hardcore fans. Which try to please they- both. Which is what they've been doing. Yeah, Giles basically told me that uh, they were going to wait and see how this is received. And given the advanced sales, it's been received very well, mm-hmm. especially the $150. Or actually, it's lower now. It's gone down, I think, to close to $120. $120 box set. And if that's the case, what, who knows what's going to happen down the road. Um, I know, Alan, with that BBC interview 
Giles made reference, or a lot of people took it as the White Album. You think it? You think he? He said definitely. He said, "Quote: The White Album will be the next release." And he he obviously dialed it back. And my theory is that he was told by Apple, uh, "Listen, you can't say that yet." But he mm-hmm. said, "Will be." He didn't say, you know, originally he, he was making it sound and, and people were taking it as, okay, okay, okay. What he meant was that the White Album was the next release after Pepper. And that's, right. what, that's what he He's, said the next day on Twitter. He said – Yes, that's, that's, what he, what he that's what he said. But if you go back to the tape, he said, will be the next release. And, and uh, I don't know. I mean I suppose people can slip. We do it here all the time. <laughs> But, no, <laughs> no, we don't. Yeah, we but don't. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, keep yeah. your hands off my baby. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. There uh, we go. <laughs> but um, yeah, right. Uh, but it sounded to me like he really was saying this will be the next release, and he just happened to have let it out, you know, without thinking that he wasn't supposed to. And you know, generally, he's been really good in interviews about saying that you know we'll see how this sells, but. You know, I think we we pretty much know that this is what they would like to do. I mean, it could be that they need the market validation of it selling well. But, you know, the fact is OnePlus was almost the beginning of this. I mean, they did experiment with it on uh, Yellow Submarine Song Track. You know, those mm-hmm. were all remixes mm-hmm. too. Let it be naked. And- and let it be naked, yeah, you know, so they've and but with one plus, especially, you got the feeling that okay, we've got Giles Mar- Martin and Sam O'Kell, and um this is the team that's going to do this, they're approximating the mono mixes, which made a great deal of sense for the singles. Um, the new mixes sound good. People like them. Okay, we go do the next one. That's Pepper. Uh, you know, I don't know if they're going to have to do it on a case by case basis or whether they're going to just bite the bullet and say this is the most amazing catalog in the world and it deserves the kind of attention that we gave Pepper. All of it, every single one. Um, you hope. You hope. You hope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have, I have a, you know, I have to say I have, I have slightly mixed feelings about the White Elk coming next. I'll tell you why, because I've been telling people that I have this deal with God where, like, I can't die <laughs> until EMI releases the twenty-seven minute Helter Skelter. And suddenly, you know, I mean, that seemed like a really good deal when there was no possibility they were going to release that. I mean, it doesn't mean I have to die when it comes out, but it's just like that's my shield, right? That's my protection. (laughs) Um, So, you know, the fact that the White Album might be next and they might actually consider releasing the 27-minute Helter Skelter, this could be dangerous for me. So um, (laughs) – I'm thinking and there's a there, there's a lot there too. I mean, if you think about it, that's why I didn't even think about the 27 minute Helter Skelter with when all that you know White Album stuff came out. I, the first thing I thought about was the the Escher demos. That was the first. yeah yeah absolutely. You know, and we had five or six of those on anthology that were in stereo and were much better quality than we had heard before, which is from a cassette that Yoko had that she gave to Mm -hmm. Westwood One. That's like several generations down. Um, The sort of problem is that um, when they were putting together the anthology, George Harrison decided that he was going to determine which of those tracks got used. And he gave them to Apple and he said, this is all I've got. But he had previously said in a 1987 interview with Musician that he had the whole thing and it would make a great unplugged album. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess it depends on how he felt about things at a certain point. And at the time of Anthology, um, eight years later, he wasn't feeling like he wanted the whole thing to come out. So he just gave them those tracks. So it's going to be up to whether Olivia and Danny feel better about giving Apple the whole set. But that obviously would be, uh, you know, disc one of the outtakes, I would think. And then there Mm -hmm. is so much, so much has come out. I mean, I mean, there's like a whole disc of outtakes of Blackbird, right? You know, that's been bootlegged already. 
And there's trying the to think about that. that. I'm trying to think of those. I, I can't think of them offhand, but I so guess you're right. Called here today, gone tomorrow. Wasn't that? Oh right, good. okay. Had a lot. Okay. Of, had a lot of uh, white album stuff, and there was the, rev- the revolution stuff, right? And mm-hmm. you got to figure that you know the way they included strawberry fields and penny lane they would probably include hey jude and revolution um <laughs> because it also gives them material for the the accompanying video disc which could have all of the frost outtakes and the mm-hmm. you know what was actually shown on frost i mean all those things are out they're available on bootlegs yeah. so yeah. you know including where the beatles are counting in and play the david frost theme there were like four takes of that and they're all mm-hmm. different you know so there's tons of stuff, you know. So now that we've figured out Apple's next release. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can just send us a check for a consultant. Well, I think what they would do is just send me a copy of the 27-minute Helter Skelter. Because I, I'm already – I should probably have my lawyers look into this and, and see whether, you know, if, if, the, if the terms of my deal with God was that EMI had to release – the 27 minute helter skelter and EMI doesn't actually exist as such anymore and it would be universal that might not oh, yeah. actually fulfill the deal uh oh I, I could live okay. forever <laughs> 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 which is what it would take if you want to wait for all of the things that Apple should be putting out that's right that's right oh well this has been crazy let's put it that way <laughs> We we tried to be structured, and where did we go? But that's mm. beside the point. I, I don't know what to say, except uh, if you want to get a hold of the show, you can write to us at things we said today at G, uh, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page, of uh, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio uh, Show. We have a twi- uh, Twitter account, Things We Said Fab. We're on Podbean. The shows are on Podbean, on uh, YouTube, and they are also on Google Play. There's a new one for you guys. Uh, so go to Google. You can check us out at Google Play. Uh, Alan, you want to? You have anything uh, coming up? You want to talk? Your your story on uh, Sergeant Pepper was in. Well, yeah, I think it Journal. was uh, Wall Street Journal Thursday the 18th, I think it was, uh, and obviously it's still online. They have a paywall, but um, sometimes you can get through. Um, okay. And then I'll have you know a longer version coming up in the next issue of Beetle Fan, which um, not sure quite when that comes out, I think in July. And um, okay. yeah, that's uh, – I'm going to be actually on um, June 6th going to be on a panel at the Paley Center um, oh, really? in, in New York um, talking about Sgt. Pepper and the Summer of Love. And uh, the panel keeps changing a little, um, but so far the other panelists are Michelle Phillips um, from the Mamas and Papas, mm. of course. It was going to be Al Cooper, but he dropped out because of health reasons, they said. And um, they're replacing him with, I can't figure out entirely the rationale, but uh, um, I'll figure it out. It's it's Kenny Loggins um, and, wow. and D.A. Pennybaker. And uh, Graham, Graham Nash is going to be the moderator of this panel. Uh, that's June 6th in New York at the Paley Center. And otherwise, you can reach me at Alan Cozen on Facebook or Alan Cozen Remixed on Facebook. And Ken? Uh, you can reach me at my email address, everylittlething at att.net, plus my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Just want to mention one thing here because I think I mentioned this in, in the last show. I have a new page, which is called Important Links. And what I've done is every time I see an interesting article on Facebook on the Beatles, then I just put the link on this one page on my website. So I've accumulated all these different uh, articles on the Beatles, lots on Sgt. Pepper, lots on Flowers in the Dirt, lots on George Harrison's uh, vinyl catalog, Julian Lennon's uh, new children's book. And in fact, it's got the links there for Alan's article in the Wall Street Journal on Sgt. Pepper. It's got uh, your article, Steve, and Variety about who the real Sgt. Pepper was, which okay. we got from Bruce Spicer's book. And also your new article, Steve, uh, from Billboard with the interview with Giles Martin, the link is all there. So it's just a very handy way, if you want to do a lot of reading on the Beatles and you want to know 
some of the, the new articles that are out there. It's all on one page called Important Links. So check that out if you can. Plus, there's Beatles trivia every week. You can win Brian Ray's new CD with the bayonets called Crash Boom Bang, as well as Flowers in the Dirt, the special edition, at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay. And you basically <laughs> stole my my promo because I was going to say I had a, an interview with Giles Martin in Billboard, and I had the, the article on uh, the identity of the real Sgt. Pepper um, okay. in Variety. Um, so you basically stolen everything uh stolen everything i've done i will say the one article that i really if you if you did not see it and it has nothing to do with the beatles really is the interview with dion i did a few months ago for for, uh, for billboard that was my that's probably one of my favorite articles at the moment oh. um and if you have not seen it it, it was before the uh, his album came out, uh, um, but uh, it's a great. It, it was really good to talk to him. So there we go. Uh, anyway, I guess we'll just say goodbye uh, for uh, Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen. This is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, saying thank you for listening. Be sure to catch us on Podbean, YouTube, Google Play, Facebook. We're all over the place, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.